It's fast, it's black, and just like my dad, it only stuck around for three years. It's one of my favorite cars. It's the Buick Grand National. For years, Buick has kind of been the General Motors family's weird uncle or cousin. In fact, today's Buick entire marketing strategy is based on people not even knowing what a Buick looks like. That's not a Buick. That's what I told him. There is one fabled Buick that broke the mold. It redefined the muscle car and proved to America that there is a replacement for displacement. It started as a publicity stunt and branding only, then became a legitimate, history-making collector's car. It was made in limited quantities, has a ravenous fan base, and for a brief window in the 80s, you could race one off the line and beat a Corvette. My favorite part, you can get it in any color you want, as long as it's black. Make it black. This is everything you need to know to get up to speed on the Buick Grand National. Historically, when thinking about performance, Americans prioritize muscle. On the outside, you could have a sweet stang, dude. But if she only had a V6, you'd have nightmares about people popping the hood. I don't know what's underneath the hood, and I don't give a shit. I'm insatiable! In the early 80s, Buick was shamelessly rolling out underpowered V6 streetcars, which was really weird because in 1981 and 1982, they won the NASCAR Grand National Series back to back. Knowing that what wins on Sunday sells on Monday, Buick tried a quick rebranding of their Regal, and they sent 215 charcoal gray units to Cars and Concepts of Brighton, Michigan. There, they retrofitted the Regals with the Grand National package. It was a rush job. It's like they woke up, checked their calendar, and said, special car project due today. Oh, crap, I didn't even read the book. The guys at CNC did their best. They added light silver fire mist paint to each side, red pinstripes, and Billboard shadow lettering proclaiming Buick. All the trim was blacked out with black vinyl tape and a front air dam and rear spoiler were installed. True to Buick form, this 82 Grand National came with a naturally aspirated V6 engine that made a whopping 125 horsepower. You! Yes, 1982 Buick fans, they did make 35 of these with a turbocharged 3.8 liter V6 that bumped it up to 175 horsepower, as much as a 90s GTI, but the car weighed in at 3,500 pounds. But we said everything you need to know, so I told you about it. Gee, that's nice, thanks. The Grand National treated 1983 like the off-season. Buick gave it a break so it could return faster, stronger, and with a clearly defined mission. In 1984, things started to get exciting. The Grand National came charging back with a new uniform. All black, like the Raiders, baby, and a new powerhouse. The turbocharged 3.8 liter became standard and was refined with sequential fuel injection and distributorless computer-controlled ignition. To make room for this new technology, hoods on the Grand National were defined by the iconic iconic power bolt, or me in a speedo. <laughs> I swear I didn't make that up. It's actually called a power bulge. It's in the brochure. And this technology squeezed 200 horsepower at a little V6. Big deal, James, you cry. My 2010 Honda's V6, and it makes 200 horsepower all day. Friends, you gotta remember that the Grand National was doing this at a time when new emissions regulations were handcuffing manufacturers and choking horsepower. The Grand National made 200 horsepower with a V6 when the same year Corvette only made five horsepower more. On the track, a Buick was making the quarter mile in 15.9 seconds, just short of the Corvette's 15.2. 2,000 Grand Nationals were made in 1984 and they sold out quick. Buick started to realize that people actually liked badass cars. Weird. In 1985, the Grand National changed little under the hood. Outside, they ditched the chrome because badass. Again, compared to its contemporaries, it was holding its own. And the boys at Buick could let the previous year's performance and its sick black paint job buy them some time while they figured out the next step for their new poster child. By the next year, Buick had it almost perfected. The 86 Grand Grand National's engine now produced 235 horsepower and 330 pound-feet of torque. But how? Technology, my man! The new Grand Nationals were outfitted with air-to-air -air intercoolers and a more refined sequential port fuel injection system. This Buick was now making the quarter mile in under 14 seconds and rocketing from zero to 60 in under five. A Buick was now the fastest American production car. It was dominating the 86 Corvette, Camaro, Mustang, Firebird, and it was doing it with a V6 engine. Buick announced that 1987 would be the final year of production for their badass Darth Vader vehicles. And as a send off, GM created the least appreciated greatest car of all time, the 1987 Buick Grand National Experimental. 547 of these Grand Nationals were chosen to become monsters. 
Buick sent 547 Grand Nationals with a special GNX interior trim package to McLaren. Yeah, dude, that McLaren, where they would become the Grand National to end all Grand Nationals. At McLaren, they were fitted with bigger turbos, bigger intercoolers, a new ECU, better suspension components, bigger exhaust. It was louder, faster, and 100 times more badass. They took a really cool car, they handed it over to Bruce McLaren, and he made it even fucking better! Jesus Christ. The only thing that they did to it that was kind of lame was they kept it from doing wheelies. They had to keep it from doing wheelies. On paper, Buick alleged that the GNX would produce 276 horsepower and a very substantial 360 pound-feet of torque. But as the car started track testing, the GNX finished the quarter mile in 12.7 seconds at 113.1 miles an hour. That is 0.3 seconds faster than the Ferrari F40, almost a second faster than a Porsche 930. And it went from zero to 60 in 4.6 seconds. The only car that was faster than it was the Lamborghini Countach. Enough. In world. Pretty much everyone agrees that Buick kept this a secret because it would have tarnished the image of GM darling, the Corvette. That's f***ing so sweet. I mean, not only is this guy like the most powerful guy in the universe, he's humble too, and he cares about his friend the Corvette. Darth Vader doesn't brag, he just does this with his hand. And then you start choking. I think I like the GNX even more now. Not only is it super powerful, but it cares about his friends, just like Michael Clark Duncan in Green Mile. Now I'll leave you with this. You may have noticed that we're in something of a last hurrah of American muscle right now. Mustangs, Hellcats, Demons, Camaros, one-upping each other year after year. We haven't heard anything from Buick. Well, here's a bit of excitement for the rabid fans of the Grand National. Less than three years ago, GM renewed the trademarks on the names Grand National and GNX. Is the Grand National coming back? I don't know. Sandbagging, son of a bitch. But I honestly don't think it needs to. After years of getting shit on as a third tier quality family car, Buick quietly and triumphantly drove the GNX to the pinnacle of untouchable performance and ruthless bravado, only to clap their hands together, wave goodbye, and retire the champion. Let the kids fight over scraps. The GNX means Buick has nothing left to prove. That's everything you need to know to get up to speed on the Buick Grand National. Please subscribe and comment below. What do you think the most underrated car is? What did we miss in this? What other cars do you want to see us cover. What kind of Buick did your grandma drive? Yeah. <laughs>